Midday Treat with NAZ Elite, a monthly podcast in which I chat with Hoka NAZ Elite team members, and you'll get a behind-the-scenes scoop on their training, racing, and everyday lives. I'm your host, Eric Sensman. You can find our monthly podcast on SoundCloud uh, by searching Hoka NAZ Elite, and you can learn more about the faces behind the team uh, by visiting their website, nazelite.com, their Facebook page, Northern Arizona Elite, or their Instagram and Twitter, both at NAZ underscore Elite. All right, welcome to this episode of the NAZ podcast, uh, Midday Treat with NAZ Elite. Uh, this time, I have the pr- privilege of welcoming Rory Linkletter. Rory, welcome to the pod. Thank you. So this is our your first time on the podcast, yes. which makes sense. Because you've officially been on the team for a week, a maybe. Week, yeah. So this is our our intro pod with you. So we'll look forward to having you on in the future. Yeah. After some I'll races, try to do something worthy. <laughs> that's to get right. Back on. That's right. <laughs> I think that's the idea. Well, I don't think. I think on the team, the idea is if you do something well, you get on the podcast. I don't know that that's anyone's goal, well, but... Uh, hey, we can make it a goal. It depends <laughs> on how much fun we have. Exactly. I like that. Uh, yeah, so we're just kind of going to cover your your story, your background, um, grown up, high school, college. So we'll walk through it all and, and what got you here to Flagstaff. Okay. Sounds uh, good. So I do understand you're still a Canadian citizen. Still a Canadian citizen. Yeah. No American citizenship. Yeah. So you were born mm-hmm. in Calgary, right? I was born in Calgary, Alberta, which is... If you jump on the 89 here, head north, it connects to I-15, yep. I-15 all the way up. So when I lived in okay. Utah, I was you could take one freeway all the way to where I was born in Canada. Uh, okay. so. And that was still probably quite a drive, right? Yeah, From it was 14 hours. 14 hours. It's not a close drive. It's sure. just straight shot up. Right, right. And so did you, you made it to high school, uh, you made it to Utah by high school? Or? No, I was, so my mom moved to the States when I was six. Six, okay. So I was a, a young one. But my dad still lives in Canada Got and it. all my other family. I basically, my mom moved here and that's it. And I okay. went with my mom. Sure. Um, and so I've been in Utah. I had been in Utah for 16 years when I'm just, now I'm a Flagstaff resident. But yep. yeah, so 16 years in Utah, six years in Canada. But in those 16 years I lived in Utah, obviously my father lived in Canada. So I was constantly bouncing between that grandparents in Canada, cousins, sure. uncles, aunts, everyone else. So yeah. I stayed really connected to Canada, but I've been an Americanized Canadian. Right, right. So, definitely. And there is a difference, I think. Yeah, I think that if you talk to someone who, you know, competed at the high school level in Canada, me, I'm kind of like, is somewhere in between that person that decided, like, one of their parents was was Canadian, and they compete for Canada, and the true born, raised Canadian. I I take a lot of pride in being Canadian, but I... I'm kind of a tweener. I'm kind of don't belong anywhere. I'm kind of not American, not full Canadian by right. by everyone's standard, but I embrace you know representing Canada. And... Sure, sure. And so you, yeah, I think. Well, we'll we'll get to the later stuff, but um, high school that was long. You'll have to forgive me. I know very little about your high school career. Yeah, it's okay. There wasn't much <laughs> to know other than just a, another high school kid competing at the state level. You know, hopeful like. I'd call myself like a hopeful NXN guy, hopeful Foot Locker guy, never made it, uh, always relevant on the state level, but never won a state title. I was second once and top five, I think six or seven times. Okay. So I was always in the mix, never won one. So by, you know, some most professional runners, people that make it to the professional level probably were, you know, state champions. I, there's obviously exceptions to that. But, sure. sure. But, uh, but yeah, so I, it, my high school career was modest, but good enough to get me to the Division One level where I, you know, went on to BYU. Yeah. So what did that look like when you when you were looking at college? Did you have, uh, did you want to stay near home? Did you have many options? What led to BYU? So I did not want to stay near home. Okay. And my number one goal when I started the recruiting process was, let's see if I can get out of Utah. I thought that that would be really cool to, you know broaden my horizons, try something new. I thought big school would be really fun. So my, I was really proactive in the recruiting process, emailing coaches, giving them my information, like, hey, this is me, This is, these are my personal bests, my junior year of high school. And then they would call me. And then I would tell them, 
that my financial situation and how I couldn't pay out of state tuition unless I got like a lot of help. Yeah. And then it was like, that was pretty much the conversation for a lot of coaches. Okay. I had a few, uh, you know, longer, more drawn out stuff than that. But basically by the end of the recruiting process, I had realized I hadn't run fast enough to get big offers from out of state schools and I needed the financial help. So in state or BYU, which is kind of a really unique one. It's a private school, but it's a very inexpensive private school. It's a subsidized school through a church. Yep. Um, so it's very inexpensive. And they check the box of big school. They yeah. check the box of great program. Yeah. And when I visited, I was like blown away by the culture of the team and, you know, the resources that they had. Like I would visited some other smaller state schools in Utah, like Southern Utah yeah. and Weber State. Yeah. And I just didn't, it just didn't feel like the fit for me. And then sure. I went to BYU and it was like December, my senior year. And I was like, I'm done with the recruiting process. I think I feel good about this. Okay. Yeah. And we'll talk about some of that culture and, and what led to success at BYU for you. Um, but uh, yeah, before we do, I, I do understand as well, your, your mom's Mormon, right? Yes. But you yourself are not. So my mom was raised Mormon. Okay. She's not currently okay. an active member of the church. Yep. Uh, my dad isn't at all. Yep. So it's kind of, I kind of have a unique dynamic. So I, I had a lot of Mormon connections. Okay. Um, but me going to BYU had nothing to do with the church. Sure. Uh, it was a completely like a decision based on what I thought was best for me academically, right. uh, financially, and as an athlete. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean... It would, I wasn't at all culture shocked by going to BYU. Right. A lot of people that, you know, aren't active members of the church would go there and be like, whoa, this is very different. But for me, it was like, one, I lived in Utah, so I kind of knew. Two, my mom was raised in it, so I was kind of aware of the uh, the ways of the LDS church. Sure. So I wasn't shocked by any of that culture at all. Yeah. And so it, it seemed like a, a fair fit. I knew that I wouldn't have a hard time, you know, staying out of trouble. And I liked the idea of like the rules being yeah. very conducive of like running. Sure. Like, uh, sometimes they're a bit like intense, yep. but it, it worked out well for me. Yeah. And so basically, yeah. Had you grown up somewhere else that BYU might not have been? Yeah, it might have been a culture yeah. shock. I, I always tell people I get asked a lot by people that aren't members of the church if they should consider BYU or why they should, what they should be weary of. Right. And I always tell them, you know, it really depends on the person. I feel like I handled it well, but there was definitely times where like it was tough, it sure. was, like being a little different than everyone else. Yeah. But uh, overall, the team loves you no matter who you are, no matter what your faith is. And it's a really welcoming group. So I don't think it would kill anyone to be there. It's just you kind of have to be ready for the difference sure. in culture. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so yeah, you did end up at BYU. Um, you then v rather quickly went from a runner-up at the high school, at the state level, to a runner-up in the NCAA 10K yes. uh, your sophomore year, so pretty pretty early on. What, um, that, that's, a, that's a quick jump, uh, I think, uh, well, for anyone going from the high school level to the NCAA Division One level. Yeah. Um, but to find that success so quickly, what, what allowed for that in that short period of time? So I came in at a really cool time at BYU. So we had just, when I was a senior, when I decided to go to BYU, they'd just been a podium cross-country team. They just had the Miles Batty era, the uh, Jared Ward college career. So there was a lot of like talent around, but they hadn't really assembled the perfect team yet. Yeah. They had great teams and they obviously like you don't podium without having a pretty dang good team. Yeah. But they were in a growth stage after, I, once I came in, they were like on a rebuild. They had just had all this success in the previous three years before I got there. And then it was like, oh, they're in a total rebuild, but they had a few individuals that were super talented. So I got to be one in a, in a rebuilding time where I got to kind of influence that culture a lot and right. got the opportunity to still learn from people that were really good. My freshman year, there was a guy named Jason Witt. There was a 27, 10K guy, my true freshman year, and wow. he was a fifth year senior. So super talented at the collegiate level. I got to learn a lot from him. Uh, 800 runner Shaquille Walker was a super talented 144 guy. While I was there, so and although I don't run the 800, he was able to teach me things that I applied to my running, and I just credit like the coaching staff in like a huge part, like Coach Eyestone, and uh, there was a guy named Ryan Waite that was the director of ops. Now he's the coach at the University of Delaware. Like these people just took me under their wing and really taught me what it took to be successful, and really uh, I was a pretty like hungry 
go-getter young kid, so I felt like I was really under-trained in high school, and then I came into a really well-trained program, yeah. and it's just like, well, you give someone who was doing 45 miles a week and really cake workouts in high school, these big boy workouts and big boy mileage, as long as he's healthy, he's gonna be really good. Sure. So I felt like I was probably better in high school, that I would could have been better in high school had I been at a different high school, yeah. but it was a, a huge growth opportunity to join a team that was so elite and had such a good foundational training principle. So following, following that runner-up performance your sophomore year, did, um, did you feel pressure to, I don't know, eventually win, uh, had, you know, coming runner up as a sophomore yeah. or, you know, was the culture on the team a little, you know, maybe helped you in that way to not put pressure on yourself or how, how I don't, I don't think I had huge external pressure. I feel like all my pressure was internal. Okay. Like I just, when I got second, I, first of all, I, I surprised myself a little bit, but I also was in really good shape and knew I was ready to compete and I knew I just needed the right race and you know be there and like lightning struck perfectly for me on that day uh so i i would consider that one of the best races of my career just in the way that the stars aligned mm -hmm. and the fitness was there and the belief in what we were doing and i did have the element of like no pressure like right. I, when i came into the out NCAA championship i think my time was somewhere like 22nd or 23rd in the field um i did well at the regional meet but nobody really takes it, the regional meet into huge consideration going into nationals but i knew after regionals that i was in a position to compete well and i knew that the only person that was like probably unbeatable to me at that time was mark scott of tulsa and he's the eventual winner and he beat me at the regional meet and i just knew he was on another level he's now running you know a world and olympic standard stuff he's he's an amazing athlete and i knew at that time he was already at that world beater yeah, level and sure. i wasn't quite there there was a gap yeah but other than that i knew i could beat everyone else if i had the right day right and it just happened to be the right day for me. So sure. that was a, a huge breakthrough. And, and going forward, I definitely was like, okay, now I must be at a new level. Like, I think I assumed that because I was second, that now I was better than I was before I got second. And so now it was like immediate, like on me, I felt like I shouldn't lose to people because I'm, I'm a runner up in, in the NCAA as a sophomore. Like right. I should keep ascending the, the ranks and, and progress isn't always that linear. But I, I would say that coming off of that, I rode that high pretty well. Uh, I don't think I like rested on my laurels, so to speak, but I, that following summer, I put in some really, really big work and the next cross country season was the beginning of the BYU cross country versus NAU cross country saga, right? Yes. It was the, the first year we were relevant in the big picture of like who can win the national championship. And I was coming off of a runner up finish and I was our low stick. And coming into that season, I was super fit. Worked really hard all summer. I actually came to Flagstaff for a weekend that summer. And uh, funny enough, I when I was here, I totally was like, this place is awesome. Yeah. And then now I'm back here. So sure. it's like, anyways, that summer was awesome. I was super fit going into cross. And I went undefeated in the regular season, excluding teammates. So I had a teammate beat me at, I think, the Dellinger. And a teammate beat me at conference. Okay. But... Every other meet, I either won, I won or lost to a teammate. And losing to a teammate, I, like we swept our conference meet and we kind of coasted the last K because we had it in the bag. Sure. And so I, in my mind, I was like, I'm better than I was. I can win this. You know, there's guys like Justin Knight that year, and I knew the NAU guys were good, Baxter and Day. Um, but I really thought that it was similar to my 10K experience. Like, well, Justin might be on another level, but I might be right there. Yeah. And that race did not go well at all. <laughs> yeah, what I want to, that's going into 2017. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, I want to get to that next. Um, but before we do, I, I guess you were kind of seen as the the mouthpiece for, for the team at the time you were at BYU. Um, so I'm curious, you, you kind of already touched on this, but what, what kind of put you in that role? Was it just the combination of um, kind of a rebuilding phase, and so that a leader did need to emerge, coupled with some early success, being runner-up. Were those? Oh, was that I formula? mean, that's pretty much the formula. And yeah. I'm a very outspoken guy, so I think whether or not I'm like an elected leader, I generally like just do a lot of leading. Like I don't take a lot of crap. And sure. at the college level, uh, there's a lot of 
you'll have teammates that, you know, mess around a lot or, or you'll have like some different personalities in the locker room. And I was always the kind of guy that would speak up and speak out and try to keep us on one path towards what we were trying to do. Sure. And I feel like that was uh, something that when I had that early success, people immediately like were like, okay, well, we should listen to Rory. He's clearly doing something right. Sure. Because uh, at this time, we didn't have any All-Americans. And then I got second and it was like, okay, this is crazy. Uh, first of all, people just didn't see that coming from me. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait, we should pay attention. Rory does all these things differently than all of us. Sure. And uh, so that was huge. I think that immediately I gained, they gained a lot of respect for me. Right. I gained their respect. And I, uh, I think that that was a turning point for the whole program, me finishing runner up. I think that me, without me finishing runner up, I don't think this year we have the success we had indoor and outdoor just because the guys that ended up rising the ranks also kind of used me as like, I used to beat that guy in workouts and I'm keeping up with him. And so they started saying, well, I'm better than him. And he's obviously this good at the NCAA rank. So they started believing in themselves and it just this ripple effect of like self-belief. So I'm not going to say like I, like they definitely earned all their success, but I think the fact that uh, they used me as a benchmark and they believed that they could beat me and they probably wanted to beat me, yeah. <laughs> you know, friendly rivalries yep. within the team. It's all healthy. And yeah, I mean, it's been great uh, being a part of that team and seeing my impact. And after this season, when Clayton Young won the 10K, I, w I obviously had a bad race. And that was a race I thought I was going to win or could win. Uh, Coach Eisenhower, first thing he did is come up to me and say, like, you're the, you're the reason why we had this success. And that was, that meant a lot. It didn't console the the loss that I had just experienced sure. but I was really happy for my teammates and even Clayton Young the the one who won you know came up to me after and was uh super nice and his his parents were and it's just like uh looking back I would have loved to after that sophomore finish had a win this year or my junior year sure and it was super unfortunate that that never happened but at the same time, I don't think it takes away from like the overall effect that and the overall learning experience that I had in college. So. Right. And I think when you have that success and and when you know you're in a position of authority formally or informally, just kind of being the the leader of the team to some degree, or at least perceived as that by others. Yeah. You know, you get as you get more attention, you also get negative attention yeah that's just totally. how it works mm -hmm. and so i don't know that this is like negative or criticism but um people have said things like uh, use the word like brash to describe yeah you know your personality i suppose and i think uh, that a lot of times is based on social media yeah you totally know, people don't actually know yeah you, but, um what how how did that affect you if at all and do you feel that like any of the the criticism or, or things that were said that have been said about you are, are accurate or do you see yourself as is brash or what, what do you think about that i think that i am definitely someone that if you don't know me you probably don't like me <laughs> and i'm 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 okay with that i just hope that everyone that gets to know me eventually like learns that i'm not a bad dude yeah. and that i'm not a jerk it just comes off that way sometimes because I will speak my mind right. and I am a loud personality. And I think that um, I've already noticed that, you know, coming onto this new team, I think people definitely will have like a predisposed belief about what who you are and what you're about. When I came on my visit here, um, Sid Vaughn was like, I thought I wouldn't like you, man. And then we had a great time. We, we hit it off. And now I'm so excited to work with those guys and with, you know, Baxter and like, you know, he actually, he also had like one of those things where, uh, you know, in interviews, he'd say some things like about, uh, I think it was Wisconsin needed the home course advantage. You know, he's just being funny. And, but some people take that and, you know, everyone's going to get really upset and worked up about things you say. And so I don't think that the negative attention or the negative feedback really ever was a huge deal to me because I stayed off the let's run boards. That's one thing. If you're on let's run, you might hate yourself by the end of the day. Cause always people, advisable to stay off people. The when you're anonymous behind a keyboard, you can be pretty harsh. Uh, I, I do have people s occasionally send me something like that, that someone said about me. And I'm like, I didn't need that. Thanks, yeah. but whatever. Uh, I would say right after I got second at NCAAs that following year was an adjustment with learning the negative and the positive attention that comes with success. Yep. And I think I learned a lot in that year and I think I matured a lot. And I think that 
going forward, I will avoid some of the small errors. I don't think I made any huge mistakes, but like emotionally and mentally where to put your energy, I think is the biggest thing. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that there will be times again where people don't like me because I say something on you know Twitter or an interview that's taken the wrong way. But I think that everyone that gets to know me hopefully will change their mind about what they thought about me before that. Sure. So. Uh, very fair. Uh, so getting getting back to NCAAs, uh, p- perhaps some of what you just said at the end is going to be relevant here. But um, as, as you said earlier, it was a little bit of a, I suppose, a disappointment in 2017, probably both at the team level and for you personally. Yeah. Um, and then you, as a team, you were third. Uh, and then the next, you were 39th in 2017. And then in 2018, you were runner up. Uh, and you yourself finished 22nd. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what allowed the team as a whole and you in particular to see that improvement from, from year to year. Yeah, so the junior year in 2017 when I was 39th, I would say that was the, the one, t- the, the greatest mistake in my like emotional energy and mental like focus in my running career. Like total learning experience, total lows of lows after that. But going into the race, I was super worked up because, you know, I was invited to the pre-race press conference for the first time ever. I was kind of like one of the dudes on the panel. You know, there was like this external pressure and internal pressure of like, we can win. Yep. And to win, you need a low stick. And I'm the leader. I just got second last year. Like, and I was putting all this pressure on myself. Not like I didn't like it. Like I was thinking, oh, like I'm going to rise to this. Like I didn't think like before the race, I'm screwed because I have all this pressure. I was like... Let's go. And I think I, I burned my candle a little mm. too bright too early in the season because I was so riding that high. And I, and I just think I was up here for so long that when it came to NCAA cross and the heightened intensity of NCAA cross came, I didn't have any more energy to give to it. So the gun went off and the race, the race uh, was so fast from the gun. Baxter and Day just took it and they pounded that pace. And I think they knew I was a kicker. And they knew that they were grinders and they said, well, we're going to run our race and we'll see who's in it. And they executed perfectly. And I, w- I was one, a little burnt out, I think, emotionally from yeah. burning my candle too bright too early. And therefore, I was out of the race way early. Like yeah. physically, I was drained at 4K. I was like probably somewhere in the top 25 or 30 through halfway and I was already like, I got nothing left. And I was just going backwards. And I had to really rally to even stay all American at that point. And I think that that was like, in my mind, I went into that race, like win or compete to win or bust. And when I was immediately out of the race, cause of the style of the race and the intensity of the race, it was like an emotional roller coaster of just like, and then finishing and being like, what happened? Like just looking back at like, what did I do wrong? You know, sure. Criticized myself a lot for that one. But, yes. Yeah. And it came in, coming back the next year, the success was better because I think I didn't burn that candle so bright so early and I didn't put all this extra pressure. I, I definitely knew we could win again and I knew it would be close and we actually made it really close that last year. I think it was maybe 25 points or something, which at a meet this big, that's like a couple pieces falling into place a little better. But I feel like this year I ran okay still. I still didn't knock it out of the park. I think knocking out of the park for for me would have been top 10, top 5 at NCAA Cross. But 22nd with how insane NCAA Cross is and how deep the NCAA is, I'd call that a, a B day. And I was actually really thrilled to at least show up, run my own race, and keep the pressure on the right things, like focusing on giving it my best effort and running my race. And it was a positive experience, even though it wasn't a perfect day. It was a really positive experience. You've mentioned now a couple times, some of the, some of the guys on the NEU team that you competed against, um, at the NCAA level. Um, and, and obviously the, the sort of BYU and NAU that sort of rising at the same time, um, both programs were great before, but in terms of when you were there, like yeah. that, that those that was a rivalry for sure. Uh, what what I guess role did that play? Like, how much of that was was help helpful? I guess, and like how much of that was kind of 
I don't know, bullshit, like not not really real or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much of it was kind of a facade? Like, what what was that? What was that like? I think it was very real. Okay. I don't think it was ever a facade. Uh -huh. I don't think it was ever like the media might have created it, but coming into 2017, we thought we could win. We wanted to win, and we knew there was only one team in our mind that could stop us from winning, and that was NAU. Portland ended up beating us that year too. So hats off to them. They ran great. Yep. But <clears throat> It still felt like an NAU BYU world. And we wanted them. We wanted to beat them. We wanted to be better than them. And we thought about them a lot that year. And when they ran Wisconsin that year and ran out of their mind, we had prenats the next day. I won prenats. Our team like scored really well. We dominated. And it was like, to us, that was like, we might have performed better than them on that day. And so now it was like, we have this mid season big invite comparison different meets diff you know but similar outcome nau dominates wisco byu dominates pre -nats. it's it was like that's when it started it was like everyone's talking about this i know they started thinking about it they started saying we need to be better to beat these guys we thought we need to be better to beat these guys and you know talking with baxter or you know other any of you guys they've they've been open about like that, that helped us. Yeah. Like, I remember after NCAA cross in 2017, you know, our heads were low. We got beat up. And uh, the NAU guys came up to us and all, like, you know, gave us a, a handshake and a congratulations and basically said in their post-race interview that they feel like they had that historical year because of the pressure of BYU rising and competing against them. Yeah. So they were the, already the defending champions, but... And they knew they were going to be better, but they weren't. I don't think they were ever expecting to be challenged. So even though we never really gave them the run that they deserved at NCAA's, I think that through training and through the season, they were elevated and we were elevated via the rivalry that was created. Right. And then the next year, it didn't lighten up. It 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 actually, I would say, intensified doubled down. a lot, yeah. doubled down. So in in track season that year, uh, at the regional 10K. I won the regional 10K. I had just come off of a bad Peyton Jordan performance and I was like emotionally like a little bit like I want to run really well at regionals so that I can like feel good going into nationals about like where I'm at. And that was a mistake. But the story goes, I won regionals and flexed across the finish line. Probably one of the not, a, not smartest things I've done. But it, I know that Baxter and Day both were like, I didn't like that. Like that was dumb. Sure. So Baxter's... uh comment the next day on his something about flexing in the prelim and that was like that was like the pinnacle of like okay i don't like these guys they don't like me let's go yeah and then uh, neither of us had the day we wanted to instead of like track that year baxter and day had a lot better of a day than me i finished eighth in the 5k but i had a really bad 10k but they were fourth and fifth in the in the 10k so they had a great 10k um but i don't think either of them saw that as like their best race sure. and I, I didn't see that weekend as my best race so then we're we're back to cross season the next year and it's bigger because everyone's pretty much coming back from the year before and we feel like we're a lot better after a, a track season they probably feel like they're a lot better and i think that it was just the whole season was again the media playing it but this time we really were focused internal we knew nau was the team to beat we knew that probably no one else was going to be able to beat us other than NAU. So the focus was definitely like, what do we have to do to match up well with NAU? And there was definitely a few conversations about like, well, if Baxter and Day do what they did in 2017, then we really need guys here and here. And we were just analyzing it a little bit. Uh, but at the end of the day, we knew we just had to run our best and hope sure. that it was enough. And we, I feel like we ran good enough to win on most years, but the NAU team was just really good, really deep. I think they had six All-Americans, even with Baxter having a, a rough day and Day not having his best day either. Their depth was just too strong. And we had four All-Americans, I want to say, but it just wasn't enough. So yeah. uh, I would say that it made cross-country really fun. It made it really intense. It made it... Our team definitely will be back this year, like, thinking the same thing. I don't think the NAU-BYU rivalry died with us graduating, sure. like these guys that left... I think it'll stay until one team's completely irrelevant in the picture, but it's it's fun. I think it really changed the sport for me 
in a lot of ways because I'm a big sports guy. I love the NBA, the MLB, you know, NHL, NFL. And this was like the first time I've ever seen like two sports teams in cross country really get like this like limelight of like rivalry. So in our own in our own world it was like the Yankee Red Sox rivalry or the um gosh Celtics Lakers. I don't know. The sure. two pinnacle programs just head to head and it it lasted for a couple of years and I think it'll continue to go for a couple more years. I think both programs have established a culture of success and right now the rest of the NCAA is kind of keep playing catch up. I I will give Credit again to Portland because they've been right there. They've been second and third the last two years too, and they're always going to be good. But yeah. I feel like until one of that, like someone takes the throne away from NAU, it'll kind of be this rivalry. So, so looking ahead, um, you ended up in Flagstaff. So you mentioned earlier you'd been here once before. You enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, of course, it's home to uh, a team that you very much uh, had a rivalry with in college. Yeah. So what what kind of led to that was there any hesitation you know what uh we can talk about of course uh NAZ elite in particular but yeah what what sort of led to the move here so obviously when i was looking to run after college you kind of the, the landscape of professional running right now is groups i knew i was a endurance athlete that his best event was going to be the marathon long term and this group is really the only group that really specializes in 10K on the track, 5K on the track, road racing and marathons. Right. Like these guys don't touch much below that. They'll do a 3K for indoors maybe or whatnot. And I, I know I've seen some athletes here run a mile here or there. I think Aaron Braun ran a mile indoors this year and one of his last races as a member of the team. But I mean, this is an endurance team. This is a long distance team. This is the team that I think fit what I wanted to do. And I think Flagstaff is the mech. Like I didn't have to be, I like without an NAU BYU, like, like Provo is a good place to train, but I knew Flagstaff was better. Yeah. <laughs> there was no doubt. Sure. Like you guys have the dirt roads, the altitude, yeah. you know, great resource to when the weather gets bad here, travel down to uh, Sedona, Camp mm -hmm. Verde. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's the Mecca. It's got everything you need. And there's not really another place quite like this in the United States or in Canada. You know, the only other place comparable is probably Ethiopia or Kenya. Sure. Like with the altitude and the dirt roads and the, the, the quality of training, there's nothing on this continent that can match Flagstaff. And I think that that I'm, I'm a running nerd. I love the sport and I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of like getting out on a dirt road and just grinding. And I think this is the place for me in that regard. Sure. I think the culture of the town's good. I like that it's a running community in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, there's a lot of draws to it. I uh, definitely thought that after Fobbles, Boston, like that was like a huge like moment where I was like, wow, these guys are like really doing it. Yeah. So, you know, it had everything. It checked every box it had. And when I came on my visit, it was even more apparent, like hypo two. Yeah. Um, they have the you know strength and conditioning, the preventative treatments, the access to like world class facilities, and just a great place to train with a great coach and the group. I think is in a in a cool stage right now with the recent success of Scott Favel, Scott Smith in the marathon, and then the new younger guys that are coming in right. with myself, Hauger, uh, Baxter, Sid Vaughn. I think it's going to be a cool time to be a member of the team and it's going to be a fun next year, yep. year and a half. And I think it'll be cool to see how many people make that international leap, like competitively to the Olympics. I know that, uh, with the fact that we have me and Baxter both being from, not from the U S uh, we both think we have a great chance of making that team. Sure. Um, I think that there's a couple guys on our team from the U S that have a great chance of making that team. And then our women have a couple of people. So it's just like this culture of success was super attractive to me because I came from a culture of success right? and I know what it does. Like the cream rises and the, when the tide raises, this, this was a saying at BYU, raise the tide, right? Yeah. Cause when a tide raises, all boats go with it. Right. So I know that this tide is raising right now and I want to be in the water to be risen with that time. Sure. So sure. It's going to be good. Yeah. Hearing you explain that, 
it sounds much like you're when you decided to go to BYU. Things just fit right, check yeah. the boxes, felt yeah. like the right choice. It's a logical like decision. Right, right. It's not that emotional. It's yep. pretty logical. I am emotionally excited sure. about the idea of like what Flagstaff as a community and as a place to train can do for me and the op opportunity to, you know, branch out, leave a place that I've lived for 16 years now and compete at a high level and, you know, chase my dream. Like right. when I got to BYU, even though I wasn't that good of a high school runner, the ultimate goal is to run after college. Like I've just had that dream for a long time. Sure. So it's definitely cool. So last couple of things, you, you've only been here, what, you got here like five days ago? Friday, Friday I got here yeah. Friday, so five days, five yeah. Days. And I came on two visits, one where I came on my official visit with the team, another I was house hunting okay. about two weeks ago. So I've now spent you know a total of like 10 days this sure. summer in Flagstaff. But I feel like I'm already getting a good taste of what it's like, and I'm excited to really work hard. I had my first hard workout this morning, right. so... I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there anything that's happened in those couple visits in the first few days you've been here that like reinforced that idea that this was a good move for you? Like any interactions with with uh, teammates or just how things have gone overall or how you feel having gotten here? Um, I would say a lot of it's just a feeling, like yeah. a, a like a gut feeling of like this is awesome, this yeah. is right. Um, but also like even you could take uh, easy runs this week with the team. It's just been fun to. Like, we're not all in town right now. Hauger hasn't moved out here. Uh, Scott Smith's still on his, like, honeymoon phase. But, uh, but like, I just know it's going to be a cool group to train with. Yeah. And it's going to be uh, a really fun fall with a couple people, like, uh, focusing on some road stuff and, you know, training together for a lot of similar goals and setting ourselves up really good for 2020. I think it's going to be really fun with this group. There's a lot of hunger in the group. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a couple chips on the shoulder. Sure. I think uh, even someone with as much success as Scott Fobble has got to be like, still have a little chip on his shoulder, right? Uh, I think that that's kind of the makeup of this team is like grinders, people with chips on their shoulders wanting to prove that they belong and, and be, you know, the next level. I don't think this team would ever be satisfied when they reach a certain level. I think yeah. they, five years ago, they were, they would have loved to have been where they're at now. And now they're here and they want to be way higher. So right. I think that it's a good good direction that we're headed. Certainly. Yeah, so uh, to finish up then, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, this upcoming year is an Olympic year. Um, what are... What are your plans? Do you do you have a particular distance you're kind of looking at, or what, what are you thinking for this upcoming year? Yeah, so we're thinking a fall marathon. So I'm running the Pan Am Games next week. I leave um, on Monday, and it'll be next Friday. I run the 10,000 in Peru, Okay. hoping to bring home a medal for Canada and, you know, make my Hoka debut with... Yeah, spikes on only because I'll be running the Canada kit, but right. but I, I do hope to have a good performance. I'm kind of uh, in a early stage of training, but I'm still feeling pretty good after today's workout, and and so th we're gonna get this out of the way, and then it's kind of fall marathon is the is the thought process here. Um, so we're probably gonna hit a, hit the fall training really hard, not a lot of racing, focusing on building and getting ready for a marathon. And then in the spring, probably get back on the track maybe and put our hat, our, our name in each hat, the marathon sure. hat and the track hat, just because Canada is going to do more of a selection than it is a true trial like the U.S. Obviously, uh, you have to have a top three mark in the country. To right. be, but with the new ranking system, it's like if you are going to make it, they're going to put your, their top three names in no matter what. Right. So... It's going to be about putting myself in a position to be top three in the country in probably the marathon with a fall performance and then the 5K and 10K both trying to just run a couple good races and see what happens. And for Canada, when will that window sort of close in terms of times? I think it's the same as when the, the times are due for the IAAF or the I, IOC or whatever. I don't even know who does this, but I think it's like July 1st or okay. like June 30th or something weird like that. It's it's like a really late date, but obviously like I'm only going to give the marathon one shot, sure. I think. I don't think there's like a, a fall spring double right. coming back in Tokyo to run an August marathon. Sure. I don't think I'll do three marathons in nine months. Yeah, that's I, don't think that's, I don't <laughs> think that's in the plan. So I think it's like a fall marathon, uh, maybe a, a half in the winter slash early spring hit the track in the mid spring and then see where 
the rankings lie and what we think our best chances are. Um, I think that there's a lot of variability the, based on how things go on what might happen. But uh, I know that right now in Canada, I have the, the fastest 10K mark, but Mohamed hasn't ran one yet. He'll obviously crush that at the World Championships. He has the standard from Gold Coast last year. Um, and then in the 5,000, I want to say I have the fourth best mark. So I'm like, on a Canadian scale, I'm already around where I need to be. I just need to raise my level so that it's like on the world scale where it needs to be. Sure. And I think that a year here will do that. Yeah. So definitely. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you hop in with the team and yeah, uh, continue to progress. So wish you the best of luck. And Thank you. Uh, we'll hope to have you back on the pod for yeah, something. Once I do something good. That's right. Yeah, look forward to there that. There we go. Thanks, Rory. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Welcome to some bonus footage. Uh, I'm here now with uh, Rory and Matt. Um, they, the two of them competed against each other at BYU and N NAU, uh, respect, respectively, as we've discussed in our podcast. So uh, now they get to actually see each other on camera, and so we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's very clear based on the interviews, you guys do not like each other at all. Um, so I want you to go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, well, since this is my hometown, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> do I like Rory is a, is a very good question. Uh, I think the rivalry we had at NAU and BYU was, was fierce uh, for very good reasons. Uh, in terms of us now being teammates, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be fun. And I think uh, especially once this cross country season starts rolling around, we're going to be hyping up each other's schools and each other's teams. But now that we have uh, a team that we can hype up together, I mean, that's going to be a fun little uh, sidetrack from what we've been used to. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Rory, what do you think? Um, well, I like I said earlier, I didn't like him when he was at NAU and <laughs> I was at BYU because of just the intensity of the rivalry. We were both kind of the faces of our programs, both trying to get at each other. Um, but I also, like we were saying yesterday on our run, is uh, I don't have a lot of uh, bragging rights over Matt because he beat me most of the time in grass. So uh, I just am excited to work with him and it's going to be really fun. Yeah. So you got, if, I mean, you were at different programs, but on similar trajectories when you were there. Um, do you think there's anything... Uh, that you learned at your program, again, uh, two different programs, but that that you can bring to the NAZ team that will be useful in terms of, you know, finding successes as a team. Um, yeah, anything coming out of NAU, coming out of BYU that you think worked that like will will work at this level. Yeah, definitely. I I mean, I think I can bring a, um, a sense of what it's like to win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I... This is not going to die soon, <laughs> yeah, is it? Yeah. going to carry on. Um, uh, I think for, for both of us, I mean, maybe just speaking on NAU, was that we we loved working hard and we loved working hard at altitude. Uh, I, I got to know what it's like to uh have easy days which complement our hard days and also be on a team that just loved each other, just loved working together, um enjoyed traveling, enjoyed having fun. And so from an NAU perspective, that's what I'm gonna try and bring onto this team, uh, which I, I can already see is already instilled for the most part in the team as well. So probably not a lot is gonna change, but there'll be a few little aspects from NAU which I'll bring over. Sure. Yeah, um, similar to what we spoke about earlier is the energy. I feel like I bring a lot of energy to practice and um, I think that that'll be a compliment to the, you know, the young, and hungry, like I said, and then the old and established, not like saying anyone's particularly <laughs> old, but the bit around, uh, the bit around yeah. the block a few times, yeah. guys. But I think, uh, I think that there's already a, a good energy of on the team, but I just think like a different flavor of that energy will be, will be nice. And, and 
I, I didn't win at BYU is at the national level, but I think that the culture, same thing, loving each other, uh, learning to work really hard together for a common goal really brings a big group of people together, and I think that that'll carry over to NAZ. Sure. Well, thanks, guys, for taking the, the bonus time here to, uh, to chat a little bit more. Um, yeah, and thanks for joining. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sealed the deal. Awesome.